morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the STSU Extension Virtual Crop Hour Series. Uh, this is David Karki. Um, I'm an agronomy field specialist from Watertown Regional Office, and I'll be your host today. Um, and the presentation today will be more about an hour, uh, but we'll have two presentations. Um, and after the after each presentation, um, you will uh, you will see a poll question uh, or a question on the, on the screen. Um, and which, you know, which will be more about, you know, your, your thoughts on today's presentation. It's not a test or anything, so nothing to worry about in that, that regard. Um, and also for those who will need uh, Q, uh, um, CEUs for uh, certified crop advise, um, advisory, then you'll, you'll get a QR code on the screen uh, and you will need to have a app downloaded to scan those codes. And I will, I will, um, Pull up those codes after the presentations are done and also after we're done with today's uh, presentation um, by about 11 o'clock or so uh, and we will switch all of you to a panelist so that you can uh, you can talk and and stick around for informal conversation uh, that will follow our official uh, one hour presentation and uh, and this week we'll be we'll be talking about various topics on oat production um, and today we have, like I said, two, two different presentations, two different speakers, and to kick off the day, or actually I should say kick off the, the week, we have Paul Johnson uh, uh, as our first speaker. And Paul has been uh, through and through Jackrabbit. He's done his, uh, he earned his bachelor's and master's from STSU and has worked uh, more than 25 years in, in STSU system. And, uh, and, and various different capacities, but currently he he uh, he uh, coordinates extension weed program and also manages Northeast Research Farm. And in addition to to his you know his profession attached with uh, SDSU, he also has been a farmer for more than forty years uh, forty years in uh, in the state. And is a little you know fun fact about Paul is he really enjoys collecting and restoring antique tractors and gas engines. Um, I think I'm going to stop that for introducing Paul. If I miss something, please feel free to continue to your, to your introduction. And floor is yours, Paul. Well, good morning, everybody. And I'll uh, get my screen uh, uh, shared here. And we can uh, get uh, started uh, uh, fairly, fairly quickly here. Um, Okay, there we go. Okay, first of all, I, I guess I'm just gonna comment a little bit on the week as uh, we have uh, uh, several good speakers this uh, week on oats. Uh, um, I'm gonna start out this morning. Uh, Dr. Adam Varenhorst is gonna talk about uh, insect pests of oats. Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, Emmanuel is going to talk about some crown rust management in oats along with Connie Strunk. And uh, uh, Dr. John Kleinjohn will be talking on choosing oats varieties also tomorrow. On the 11th will be uh, nutrient management and general agronomy or Thursday, uh, Dr. Karki and Anthony Bly. And then we will finish it up on Friday, the February 12th. Uh, uh, Neil Foster, our head of uh, crop improvement in the state, will be talking about growing certified oats. So with that, uh, a lot of good things relating to oats. And so let's uh, get started. I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, today uh, to start with in a way uh, how weed control is different notes and then we'll look at some uh, studies that we have did over the years here at SDSU on weed control in notes and uh, then we'll finish it up with a, a few other facts about oats. I guess I want to start out with uh, how's oats different uh, we have two uh, Model A John Deere's here, 
And I, I guess I would uh, look at oats being more like the uh, standard model up on your uh, left side. Um, it does have some limitations. If you look at that uh, tractor, it'd be a little bit tough to uh, cultivate corn or beans with it. Um, it also uh, would, uh, would not uh, fit down uh, our, our rows very good because there's no adjustment on, on those wheels. And so consequently, it's different than the row crop that's down on your right side, uh, even though uh, they are basically the same tractor, they drive the same speed, they have the same horsepower, you can interchange all the motor parts and uh, and so consequently they're alike but they're different and that's the way I, I look at oats and wheat. How's uh, weed control different in oats? Um, oats is a lot more sensitive to a lot of our chemicals uh, than wheat and I think we're going to see that as we go through here. Um, there's several things we need to be aware of Oats has uh, no tolerance to any of our grass herbicides that we use in wheat. Uh, years ago, we used to have a state label for a product called Stampede uh, that was a grass herbicide mainly for uh, rye, or I mean rice. And, uh, uh, but that uh, has since been dropped and so we have no post-emergence grass herbicides or pre-emergence uh, left in, in oats. Uh, oats has fairly poor tolerance to a lot of the SU type herbicides. And by SU, I mean sulfonyl urea. Um, and so consequently, uh, and a lot of our grass compounds uh, do have that uh, SU background too. Uh, oats has limited tolerance to growth regulator herbicides like uh, 2,4-D and dicamba. And so consequently, uh, we have very limited time period where some of those can be used. And even if they are, we might be taking a reduction in yield. And oats is not known for the greatest straw strength. So if we are doing anything uh, with our, our weed control uh, that's going to affect that oats plant, it uh, could make it more prone to lodging. Um, oats is very sensitive to atrazine or triazines, you know, the metribuse and things like that. Uh, that can carry over. Um, basically, if uh, you're rotating to, to oats, um, our rule of thumb is that you want to take a soil sample and uh, have it checked for atrazine if you used atrazine the year before. And if any atrazine shows up in that sample, uh, that's too much to plant oats. And where in the case of beans, we can have up to a quarter pound of carryover and uh, still be okay. Um, also, oats is very sensitive to carryover from yellow type herbicides. We don't use as many of them anymore, but uh, if we are looking at coming back after a Treflan or a Prowl or something like that, there is concern that it can damage the oats where if we were looking at wheat or barley, uh, that would be the ideal place to go because those products are labeled on them at lower rates uh, pre-emergence or pre-plant incorporated. Uh, oats is very sensitive also to the carryover of the SU herbicides or the ME herbicides, which are in the same category, things like uh, uh, Pursuit, uh, Raptor, um, Ally, uh, a lot of those uh, compounds um, are, are very sensitive to the oats. Also, oats is very sensitive to glyphosate drift. 
um, uh, we have seen where at uh, heading time, uh, glyphosate drift at very, very low uh, levels, not enough to affect the plant at all, but will sterilize the heads and uh, end up with no oats production. So if you got an oats field nearby, got to be real careful of that. And lastly, uh, also along this line, oats is very sensitive to hot, dry winds uh, during heading, which can cause kernel blasting, which can look a lot like uh, glyphosate uh, drift. And so um, uh, that's a tough one to sort, uh, but uh, uh, with some experience, it can be sorted out. So this is how I start out with uh, how oats is different from wheat. If you've grown wheat in the past and you haven't grown oats, these are a few of the things you need to know uh, before you start going into oats. A um, couple years ago here, we did a test on uh, uh, kosher control in oats and uh, we're just going to look at uh, some of the things here. We start out with a bison at a pint rate. The uh, VCRR is the visual crop response rating. So this is a number one to 100 on how much uh, basically injury we do see. Uh, then we look at the kosher control early, uh, 6.2 in this case, and the kosher control um, at uh, basically when the crop's starting to ripen, uh, 7.15. So we can see here uh, with the bison or uh, in the old, old days, we'd call that uh, bronate, um, does fairly good on the kosher. Uh, Banville 2,4-D, this was our original kosher treatment, uh, 88.99, but we can see we've got uh, a uh, greater crop response there. And uh, we never could go over three ounces of Banville in oats or we really had some, some injury problems. Star Rain Ultra, six ounces, uh, no crop response and very good uh, kosher control. Star Rain Flex, just a little bit of crop response just so we can kind of see something but uh, not enough to affect the crop at all. A uh, little bit down on the kosher initially, but uh, by the time uh, the crop is getting ripe, it's just fine. Voucher, uh, again, kind of the same way. A little bit slower acting there. Uh, wide match, also a little slower acting, but uh, no, no crop response. Harmony, um, we know that uh, a lot of our kosha is resistant to the SU uh, herbicides. Consequently, why we only had 64% uh, control of the kosha here. And this is in a field that never had an SU herbicide on it. However, uh, a lot of the neighboring fields may have. And so consequently, uh, the uh, kosher seed uh, through its normal tumble action or rolling of those uh, kosher plants in the fall has spread uh, from the neighbors to his field. And consequently, uh, Harmony, which uh, without being resistant to uh, SUs will do a very good job on kosher but I don't think we've got a place left in the state where it's gonna work real good for us. Weld, uh, again, uh, very good control. Uh, Callisto, uh, this is the one, and we're gonna talk more about it here in a little while, but Callisto uh, is labeled um, pre-emergence and post-emergence in oats. It's not labeled in any of the other small grains. And again, uh, showing you how it's a little bit different. Uh, kind of uh, slow on uh, initial, uh, but uh, up to 90% uh, at canopy. 
or at uh, ripening. Uh, AIM and MCP, we can see uh, the AIM here again. We got some more crop response there, but did a, a fairly good job on the kochia. The MCP is just put in there for other broadleaves to help out the AIM. And, and so consequently that gives you uh, some of the treatments we looked at again, uh, you know, uh, fairly limited there. If we go back, uh, uh, we basically got about 10 treatments is uh, all we uh, can look at in oats. We just don't have that broad range that we do have uh, when we're looking at uh, wheat. A um, few other things um, and back a few years, uh, SDSU uh, screened all of the oats varieties to determine uh, their crop response. It was part of the breeding program uh, back in the day. And uh, we always looked at the 2,4-Ds. Here we can see 2,4-D amine at a pint had 10% crop response, 142 bushel yield. If we put ester in there instead of amine, crop response doubled and we lost about 10 bushel oats. MCPA amine, um, you know, which uh, has a lot better uh, crop tolerance on oats, uh, no visual response, uh, went up about 30 bushel on yield. Uh, MCP ester, uh, same way, no crop response, a good yield. Uh, Bronate advanced, uh, probably the highest yielding of any of them in here, no crop response. Uh, Clarity and MCPA, uh, definitely got this on at the right time early and uh, didn't have a crop response. And this will vary from year to year, uh, depending on how warm it is. If it's cool conditions, uh, the oats will tolerate it better than if it's warmer conditions. Star rain, um, and, and this would have been the old straight star rain uh, back in the day and uh, 166 bushel. Uh, check at 162 bushel. And uh, uh, we had a 20 bushel variation uh, with our LSD at a 95% confidence interval. So we can definitely see the two 4Ds, if you use them on oats, you're really uh, knocking a good uh, 20 to 30 bushel um, off from the check where there's absolutely no weed control in. And uh, we can see if we look at some of our top treatments here, uh, another 10 bushel there. A uh, few more things, uh, looking at the oat screening here, star rain plus curtail M, uh, good. Uh, AIM was good. Uh, Harmony GT. And this is back when it was the 75% uh, uh, GT. And so it uh, was good. The Callisto, this was back when Callisto was first being looked at in oats. And so we were down at a 2% two ounce post-emergence rate, uh, but uh, didn't have any yield effect. Here we can see the Stampede product too. Like I said, that's no longer available. Uh, this one did have uh, uh, some grass control to it, but uh, it also, uh, if it was cool, damp uh, conditions out, uh, could really yellow the oats for a week or two, but didn't really seem to affect the yield. Now here, uh, if we're spraying at early boot with MCPA, it didn't show no visual crop response, but uh, there's no way to know here whether the late application knocked our yield or did the competing weeds uh, knock that yield. Here we also got bronate advance uh, at early boot and we can see also we knocked yield. So whether it was the chemical or, um, or uh, the weed pressure, 
basically saying we don't want to wait late uh, with our small grains. We want to get those products on when the weeds are small and conditions are right. And uh, we're going to help our yield in the long run. And again, uh, as in the previous one, the check was at 162 and the LSD at 20. One of our more recent studies on oats, we looked at Canda thistle and uh, we uh, uh, looked at one of our new uh, products uh, that's really an old product. Uh, this is Diclo-Prop or uh, uh, better known as MCPP. It's mainly been used in the lawns, uh, actually came out in the 40s, but uh, found out this uh, product has good uh, kochia activity in the last couple of years. And so we're looking at it uh, on different weeds and across the board and uh, looks very promising for the future. Actually is not labeled in any of the small grains yet, will be a year or two uh, before we get there. But the 12 ounce rate uh, had 69% uh, canned thistle control, uh, 16 ounce rate up to 76, and 32 ounce rate uh, up at 89. Very uh, likely that this rate would be higher than what we'll ever see. But uh, it was good to note, uh, we have no injury ratings here because uh, none was seen on the oats. And so consequently uh, uh, looks to be very safe on oats too. Uh, Husky at 11 ounces had 71% uh, thistle control, 15 ounce up to 74. And uh, we had a LSD variation of 4%. Now, a few more treatments uh, in that same lineup. Um, here we uh, look at Diclo-Prop plus Husky um, and uh, up at 86, just a few different rates here. Um, and uh, we're all in the 80s uh, up to 90%. Uh, here with the bottom one. And uh, uh, look like we've got some very good uh, treatments. This diclo-prop is very slow acting on Canda thistle. And uh, um, so takes a long time for it to take it down, but uh, should indicate that it's getting into the roots uh, fairly well too. Now uh, back to the screen, we looked at Callisto. And it really does have a fairly good safety margin. Uh, six ounce pre, uh, no crop response. 12 ounce pre, obviously wouldn't use it that rate. This was a screening to determine safety and uh, obviously is quite a bit of safety there in oats. Uh, Callisto with crop oil. However, if you put the nitrogen in with the crop oil, all of a sudden we're getting a crop response there. And uh, it is labeled with nitrogen, uh, but uh, I would not be using it unless uh, uh, there was a real need to add that nitrogen. Also, we found out that Callisto is safer on oats with crop oil than it is with a surfactant. And uh, we can see that here with the NIST. And then uh, also, uh, with the nitrogen in there, uh, we got more uh, crop response rating too. Uh, check again, uh, we can see there, and uh, 13 bushel this time. So really everything about the same, but uh, uh, definitely the pre or the uh, three ounces uh, post with crop oil looks to be the two uh, preferred uh, ways to use it there. Some mixtures also to see how uh, they affect it. Bucktrill does have the oils in there and so does MCPA. So consequently, it heats up the Callisto a little bit. Um, just the straight MCP appears a lot safer uh, than uh, with the, the Bucktrill in there. Um, here we start out with the Callisto Pre, come over the top with the Bucktrill MCP. 
Uh, seems that would be fine. It's the mixture of the two together uh, is where we see uh, there's some added uh, the injury there. Uh, the Bucktrail and MCP without the Callisto, uh, no injury there. And uh, the, just the MCP alone. And uh, we can see uh, what happened there. Okay, just a little bit to kind of finish up here, um, just to give you some oats facts. Leaves turn left instead of right. If you're out in the field and you take your uh, finger and thumb, uh, the oats leaves will always uh, twist to the left where wheat will twist to the right. Uh, collar is divided instead of continuous. Uh, oats has an open panicle. Plants are blue green in color. Um, oats are heart healthy. And do you grow oats or oat? You don't grow wheat. Just kind of a, a fun one to finish up there with. And uh, here's my contact information. And with that, uh, I will uh, uh, turn it back to uh, David uh, to uh, uh, see if we got any questions and we'll do the poll and the uh, other things we need to do uh, before we go on to Adam. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I did like your fun fact at the very end, oat or oats and both terminology is, you know, they, they get used so synony synonymously all the time. Uh, I do have one question uh, there on my chat box. Is it safe to say that oats are sensitive to most all soil applied herbicides or not totally correct? Um, yeah, I think uh, the only herbicide we have labeled uh, uh, soil applied is Callisto. And uh, uh, yeah, there's no labeling for the Treflans, the Prowls, uh, obviously not, uh, um, you know, and, and even carryover uh, is a real concern. So yeah, that's pretty uh, safe to say the exemption would be the, uh, that Callisto can be used pre-emergent. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so among the small grains, that's where you're thinking, you know, referring as oats is the most, most sensitive one uh, among the small grain that we grow, right? Right. Uh, pretty much uh, wheat and barley um, and rye are all about the same. Barley uh, is a little more sensitive on a couple things than, than uh, wheat, uh, but uh, overall they're both or all of those, uh, whether it's winter or spring, are a lot safer. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, everybody's seen a uh... Uh, poll right now and, and the voting is in the process right now. So we'll get that done before I pull up the uh, QR code uh, for the CCA credit and, and we'll move to Adam after that. And if anybody has any other questions, uh, please feel free to use our Q&A or chat box uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, and even if we don't get time before Adam starts, we can always come back uh, when we're done with uh, both of our presentations today. And uh, there's another question, Paul, maybe you can ask this before uh, you know, we move to the next presentation. Please talk about that active ingredient for Canada thistle. What are some common trade names? Well, like I say, it's... Uh, 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 if you buy the Trimac for your lawn, uh, it's a three-way mix of 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. Well, the MCPP is the diclopropyl, and uh, it is a growth regulator. Um, it is just coming along. We might see it available in fallow. Um, a little sooner and we're going to see it in crops because it's never had the residues done in crops. It was always in lawns and fallow and things like that or non-crop areas. Um, but it looks like it's going to be really give us a new uh, kosher tool. 
Uh, it was basically found when they were trying to kill cotton with it that it also uh, killed uh, um, uh, kosher. And it was looked at in cotton because of the 2,4-D tolerant cotton and it will uh, kill that, uh, which was kind of amazing, but uh, uh, it shows they're different, but yet uh, they're like kind of like the oats and wheat. So we're gonna um, hopefully see it out in the next couple of years. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think we're right at 10.30 time. Um, our next uh, speaker is um, Adam Varenhorst and Dr. Varenhorst is our extension entomology a specialist in our state, and he joined our extension system in 2015, and, and we're very fortunate that we have him as our uh, state specialist for entomology, and uh, um, he comes from Iowa. Um, he did his bachelor's uh, in biology, actually, from um, Briarcliff University in Sioux City, and did his master's and PhD from Iowa State in, in, in entomology before uh, joining our extension system here in the state. Um, uh, we're very glad to have him here today, and uh, it's all yours, Adam. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for attending this morning's session. And I'll answer this question really quick, the one on the slide. Are there insect pests of oats? Yep. And uh, we could probably just end our presentation there. For I'm just kidding. Uh, so there are a lot of insect pests of oats because anything that will feed on wheat will pretty much feed on oats and other small grains as well. There are a few that we worry about more in oats, and so we'll talk about that, uh, those pests. So our early season insect pests for oats, uh, are, there are a few that we really need to watch for early in the season, uh, before plant even, and one of those insects is the wireworms. Uh, so we say wireworms, but there are actually a lot of different species of wireworms that you may come across. And so we kind of lump them all together. They all have pretty similar characteristics. They'll look a little bit different in the soil. So they're not all going to be brown uh, and look just like the ones I have in the picture here. Some will be white, uh, some will be larger, some smaller. But we typically just put them all in one group. That just makes it easier. Wireworms are typically worse for fields following grasses and pastures. So a lot of times we don't have our oats following those conditions. However, these guys have a very long life cycle as larvae in the length of two to seven years. So if you had something transition from grasses, pastures, or in some cases we're starting to see even other cereal grains or oats, uh, if you rotate back within two to seven years, you might still have a wireworm population from the last time you grew that crop. And so it's something we need to watch for because it may be out in the field. Now I will give you the heads up right away. Wireworms are not an easy insect to scout for. They're below ground. So we're going to get into one of the more time intensive, labor intensive scouting techniques uh, for this pest. And the other thing is, is that we, we don't have anything that we can really apply for wireworms after planting. They're down under the soil, so we have to monitor for the populations before we actually plant and then determine if we're at the threshold. And the threshold's one or more larva per bait station or soil sample. But what am I talking about when I say bait station or soil sample? Well, bait stations are essentially holes that you dig in the ground, you add seeds to it, you cover it back up, and then you wait a while, go back out and reevaluate to see if there are any wireworms now feeding on those seeds that you put in the hole. So depending on uh, your schedule, you can either set these up in September or early spring. In either case, you wait a few weeks after putting them in. Uh, for the spring ones, you put them in a few weeks before planting, and then you come back and you check them before planting. Uh, the fall ones for oats, you could just put them in the ground uh, and then check them in a few weeks before the first frost. The reason you might want to do it in the fall is if you're done harvesting or you have a little bit of a lull due to weather, the wireworm populations are going to be the same in the spring and fall, so either one's an okay time to look. 
This is where it gets time and labor intensive. You need to have 10 to 12 bait stations per 40 acres of a field. If you have a very large field, you could be looking at a lot of bait stations. For each bait station, you need to dig a hole that's about six inches deep and about four, four to five inches in diameter. And then pour in one cup of wheat and one cup of corn. That's the recommended mixture. You can uh, play around with that a little bit, but those need to be touching the soil. You cover up the hole with a little bit of soil again so that those seeds are covered and then add clear plastic. The plastic's there to help draw in a little bit of heat, uh, make it so that the insects are attracted to that area. It's important though to mark that area with a flag because otherwise you might not be able to find it back, especially since we're looking at so many bait stations, it's important to make sure you can go back and find every one of those. And so that's the bait station. You go back, if you have one or more wireworm larva, you're at the threshold. The alternative method is soil sampling. Now the bait station sampling may have sounded a little bit intensive, I promise you the soil sampling is just as bad. For this, you need to dig 21 square foot uh, by six inch deep holes for every 40 acres of the field. So again, a lot of sampling. The reason there's so much sampling for wireworms is the populations may have hot spots here and there. So it's important to get an idea of what the entire field looks like before you do some sort of a treatment. And then you can sift through the soil and examine for the wireworm larva for each of those holes you dig. So you're going to be breaking the soil apart and quickly examining to see if there are wireworm larva present. Out of the two, the bait station sampling is probably the easier just because of the fact that you don't need to sift through the soil. You just sift through those seeds that you put in there and obviously you'll be able to tell apart the, the seed from a wireworm. But either way, those are how you sample for wireworms. Now, if you find wireworms, your options for management are technically a seed treatment, which won't actually kill the wireworms that deters their feeding, or looking at something else uh, such as, uh, for oats is a little bit tougher, but uh, you know we don't have a lot of options for wireworms for killing them. Uh, the biggest thing is you could deter the feeding if the wireworm populations are really dense. So another early season group of pests that we deal with are cutworms. And now on the eastern side of the state, we don't worry about the army cutworm or pale western cutworm as much. Those are more central and then western South Dakota. However, both of these can be pests of oats. Army cutworms are a very interesting pest because they actually hatch in winter wheat and alfalfa fields in the fall. Caterpillars do a little bit of feeding, then they overwinter. We have had reports in South Dakota where they do quite a bit of feeding before overwintering. A lot of that just has to deal with how the fall uh, plays out. So if we have a nice warm fall and a late frost, they're obviously going to have more time to feed and we're going to have more issues associated with them. Uh, and then once they overwinter, they emerge in the spring, and they start feeding earlier than most of our other cutworm pests. And if you get a lot of feeding, they can cause some stand losses, but most of their feeding is going to be above the growing point. So if the populations are caught soon enough or they aren't terrible, the field should be able to recover. Now that's a little bit of a contrast when compared to the pale western cutworm, which overwinters as eggs in the soil. They hatch in the spring, so they show up a little bit later than the army cutworms. The big difference is, is that these caterpillars feed underground and so when they feed, they actually are killing the plant. And so they can have a major impact on stands. They're more of a wheat pest, but they can show up in other small grains. So those are a couple of the, you know, maybe we won't see them on the far Eastern side of the state, but some pests that could occur in oat fields. More likely though, we're going to be seeing this one, the dingy cutworm. Now these also overwinter in the larva. Uh, as larva in the soil. They're going to be worse uh, in areas where the crops are following sunflower. So not so much of an issue on the far Eastern side of the state here, but as we go towards the central part or anywhere that we're growing sunflowers, we're going to see more of an issue. And the reason is, is that in the fall, 
late summer fall the moths of the dingy cutworm are laying their eggs in the sunflower heads and then the larvae hatch they drop to the soil they get ready to overwinter and then they emerge the next year into whatever crop was planted following the sunflower now the feeding for these occurs in early to mid may they're going to be feeding on the mainly on the vegetation so they're defoliator they will cause some clipping though in younger plants so a large population of these could cause some issues, but cutworms and oats probably are our number one pests, but they are something to always monitor for. The thresholds for the cutworms, and this is a general threshold for all of the species, is four to five per square foot. And if they show up, pyrethroid insecticides applied later in the day or early evening are probably the most effective tool. And if you watched our crop hour on wheat, this next section is going to be very similar. And the reason for that is all of the aphid species that can be a problem for wheat can also be a problem for oats. And so we'll start with the bird cherry oat aphid. Now these are dark to olive green. They're probably the darkest green aphids you'll see in the field. And then they also have this burnt orange patch. You can't see uh, their cornicles or tailpipes very well in this picture, but they have this dark orange patch right here, and that's very characteristic of them. You won't come across another aphid species in the field that has that. These migrate to oats in the late spring and early summer. They can cause problems through direct feeding, but they can also vector uh, barley yellow dwarf fires. Our big issue though is that the populations can build up, and if they do, they may cause uh, some loss and yield over time. So something to monitor for. The next is the English grain aphid. Now these are going to be a little bit larger. They have a yellow to green body. The characteristic for these is the dark tailpipes and then these dark patterns on the legs and a little bit hard to see, but also on the antenna. So it's not completely black legs, but they have alternating dark and lighter sections. And the same thing would be true for the antenna if we could see it better. So some characteristics to watch for if you're scouting and see aphids out in the field. These will typically colonize the upper portions of the plant, especially if seeds are developing. They can also vector barley all door fires. They can reduce yield through direct feeding, but again, for all of the aphid species we talk about, we need pretty large populations uh, to actually get to that point where they're reducing the yield through direct feeding. And then we have green bug, and I've mentioned it before, I'll say it again. I have not come across green bug really since I've started at South Dakota State University. So it's out there. Another one that I don't even list here is the Russian wheat aphid. Uh, both species of those uh, green bug and Russian wheat aphids are somewhat hard to find in South Dakota, which is a good thing for us, but it, green bug is the more common of the two. So. It can vector barley L door fires. It can also reduce yield through direct feeding. And it's going to be a yellow green aphid on a leaf. The characteristics for these though, is that if they're feeding on the leaf, they will cause some discoloration. So if you have a population of aphids and you see that there's also these kind of dark uh, red brown spots right around, it's always going to be right around where the populations are. It's going to be more localized that could be an indication that you have green bug in your field. So to scout for aphids, the best way to do it is to walk in a zigzag pattern through the field and then examine plants from random locations in that zigzag pattern. As you're monitoring, you need to look at the tops and undersides of the leaves. A lot of times they'll also move to the stems, so aphids on uh, small grains can be a little bit hard to scout for. Some of them also have uh, defense mechanisms where they actually will fall off the plants when disturbed, which can also make it a little bit tougher to monitor for them. But uh, that's the best way to determine if they're out in the field is to actually go and scout the plants. For management, just like we'd say for other small grains, it's important to prevent the green bridge. So uh, if you have volunteer small grains in the area, destroy those before planting your oats. Uh, delaying planting a little bit can help avoid some of these aphids uh, from showing up 
seed treatments and then foliar insecticides are the other options for really managing aphids and oats. Now the next pest is the true armyworm and this actually showed up in 2020 in some oat fields here in South Dakota. Every year I get reports of caterpillars feeding on small grains including oats now. Typically it's in wheat fields but these are a pest that migrate from the southern United States and because of that we don't have a perfect window of when they're going to show up every year but since I've started at in South Dakota, they've shown up about every single year and caused some issues. So it's important to watch for these. They can vary a lot in appearance. So that makes it a little bit tougher to identify them really easily. They can be a dark, almost black color, a dark green, and then almost a tan color. So how do we tell them apart from other caterpillars? Well, there are some characteristics that remain even when the colors change. One of them is this orange stripe that runs the length of the body. And it's present on both sides. If you notice, that is present in each of the pictures, even though the rest of the body is a different color, that stays the same. Another thing is if you look at the head, it looks like somebody took an ink pen and just started drawing little uh, squiggly circles. And so that is a very unique thing, this network of dark lines on the head unique to the true army worms. Another thing you have to really be looking is they have the four abdominal prolegs. So here are the true legs up here. They have uh, six total, so three pairs. And then they have eight total abdominal prolegs. We call them the abdominal because this is head, this is the thorax, and then here is actually what we would call the abdomen. So they have these legs, and then if you look, we can't see it in all the pictures, but this picture shows it nicely. They'll have a dark line on each of those legs. And so those are the characteristics we can use for identifying these guys. The other giveaway is that from their name, they will show up in large groups. I've seen populations of these walk through a field. That's where they get their name. They kind of move like an army, they march. And I've seen them completely remove small grains uh, from a field. I've seen them in uh, further south remove corn from a field, uh, tire patches. So typically these will show up first in our ditches, roadways, uh, waterways, anywhere you have some grasses, small grains, they'll show up there early in the, uh, earlier. Or if you have small grains like an oat out in the field, they'll show up there as well. But they can cause a lot of problems really quickly. So. Uh, it's important. Typically, we start seeing these in July. That's when to start scouting for them. Now, the true army worms will feed on the leaves. A large population can cause a lot of issues as far as defoliation. If they destroy the flag leaf, you'll see some yield loss associated with that. Uh, as wheat and other small grains mature, they will clip the heads. Uh, because as nutrients start to dwindle, they start going for wherever they can find some if they're still in the field. And, and for oats and other small grains, that means they will start clipping those heads. And that's where we see a lot of yield loss occur. To scout for true army worms, you need to start probably with visual count, counts. So uh, the easiest way is to either grab your sweep net if you don't have one. I recommend purchasing one. There are a few different places out there where you can buy a sweep net for a reasonable price. Uh, the visual counts are a little bit harder in small grains because these guys do tend to feed in the evening hours. They can be found on the plants during the day, but most of their activity is going to be in the evening. Uh, so you're not really scouting visually for the actual caterpillars themselves. You'd be doing more of a, is there defoliation? Then you have to start really scouting for the caterpillars. The thresholds are two caterpillars per square yard or about 40 caterpillars per 30 pendulum swings with the sweep net. Now, if you're not familiar with using a sweep net, the pendulum swing just means that you go across your body once and then back again. So that's the pendulum. And so even though that would, you'd think that would count as two, the back and forth is one swing. And if you do have true army arms show up in your field, and like I said, these typically are showing up 
closer to harvest later in the season is when we really start noticing these. Two products that have the shortest pre-harvest intervals that I've been able to find are Bolton, which has a seven day pre-harvest interval, and then also Corrigin and Prevathin, they have a one day pre-harvest interval. So the active ingredients are a little bit different between the Bolton and the Corrigin and Prevathin, uh, Prevathon, but both of those uh, groups will work against these caterpillars very effectively and they won't delay harvest. Next insect group that we'll talk about are grasshoppers. Now there are several species that we worry about. A lot of times during the year, we don't have to worry about grasshoppers and oats. However, if it's a dry year and oats are one of the few green uh, crops out in the field, they will head into the oats field and cause defoliation. They will also feed on the heads. So again, they're kind of like the true army worms. They're looking for anywhere that there are some nutrients left, especially during drier years. Most of the time, grasshoppers will be more of an issue around the margins of the field. The reason for that is they're starting out in the road ditches a lot of times because there was grass there in the fall where eggs were laid, and then they'll move into the field. So that's where to start scouting and also sometimes where we see the greatest injury to the crop. The threshold for grasshoppers and oats is 8 to 14 adult grasshoppers per square yard. If you are seeing immature grasshoppers, the number is a little bit higher, but we typically in South Dakota, we just stick with the 8 to 14. And then if you see the nips or adults uh, at those levels, it's probably time to consider a management strategy. Foliar insecticides are really the best bet for oats because the timing, if it it happens to be a year where you plant the oats a little bit later. Uh, insecticide seed treatments may deter some of that feeding by the nymphs, but they will not have an impact on the later season populations. And I say to really watch closely for grasshoppers in 2021. So this year, because we saw some areas with very large grasshopper populations last year. And for the last few years, we've been seeing areas, especially on the eastern side of the state, where grasshopper populations have been building. And last year in some of those areas, it was dry. And then we're maybe going into another dry year. And so it's going to be the potential for some large grasshopper populations to show up. So uh, don't get caught off guard. Really monitor. And it'll be pretty easy to figure out if we're going to have a problem because we'll see a lot of nymphs earlier in the season and then we have to watch for those adults. So we'll monitor and then try to keep everyone up to date. And last but not least, we have a pest that's not technically been found in South Dakota. It's the cereal leaf beetle. It was introduced in Michigan in 1962. Since then, it's been found in North Dakota, Montana, Iowa, Minnesota, Wyoming, uh, like I said, but not South Dakota kind of wondering about that. Uh, North Dakota found it starting in 2000, I believe 13. Uh, so in, in counties that border South Dakota. So uh, there is a chance that this pest is here and maybe we just haven't come across it yet. So it's time to start looking. So for the cereal leaf beetles, the adults are about a quarter of an inch long. They will stand out even though they're not one of our largest beetles because they are going to be pretty shiny. They have a metallic blue, almost black head, depending on the lighting. So this picture here uh, makes it look a lot darker, but it is a dark blue green. And then they also have that same color on their abdomen. Now in the picture here, you can kind of see on top of being shiny, it, they have lots of those little pits uh, on their abdomen. So that will help you also identify them. They have an orange thorax and also orange legs, and then they have dark antenna. So that's the adults. The larvae, I don't have a picture for both forms, can either be a light brown, that's when, out, when they don't have their slime coating, or almost a black color with their slimy coating. And so these are going to be kind of a humpback type of uh, larva. They have a small head, really big body. Uh, they look like they'd be kind of uh, un... un uh, calibrated because of the shape of their body, but they move around just fine. You'd think they were a little top heavy because of how uh, their backs are much higher up than their heads, but they do move around 
and have no issues. So uh, the larva feeding is shown here in this picture. So both the adults and larva will cause similar issues on the plants. And so the first sign is the adult feeding in the spring. So the adults over winter, typically in shelter belts and groves. And so they'll emerge in the spring. They find the small grains, so oats and other small grain crops, and they'll feed on the leaves. And this is what we call window pane injury because a lot of times it looks like they're removing just little portions. And if the light hits it just right, you can sometimes see through there, uh, shown in this picture, so it's kind of clear. So we say it's like they're uh, making windows in the leaf, so we call it window pane injury. After the adults have been out for a while, we'll eventually start seeing eggs, which are orange color. Those will be laid on the leaves uh, closer to the stems of the plant. And then eventually we'll see these larvae. So this is a picture of the non-slimy cereal leaf beetle larva. So you can see they have a small dark brown head and then a larger light brown body. This one's starting to get its slime covering. The larva feeding is going to be very similar to the adults, except as you can see in this picture, uh, more intense. So if you get enough of these, they can cause some issues. They'll reduce yield. So my challenge to everybody is to start scouting for these or uh, go ahead and type in the chat if you've already seen them. Like I said, uh, they haven't been formally detected in South Dakota, but I'm guessing they are here. So that is all I have for insect pests on oats today. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I have my office phone number up here, as well as my email address. And with COVID going on and everything, and also busy schedule, the email is typically a better way to get a hold of me than my office phone number. But feel, please feel free if you have questions about today's talk, or if you have any questions during the season, to reach out and let me know. Uh, depending on our travel guidelines, I'd be happy to visit fields, or you can, with smartphones these days, take a really great picture of the pest out in the field or the damage it's causing and send that to me uh, via email and can get you an answer as quick as I can figure it out. So thank you. And I believe we'll now be going to a poll and then right after this also the CCA credits for this presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions at this time. If you have any, please feel free to type those in to either the chat or the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, David, and I, if you're talking, there you are. <laughs> yep, and I'll be showing the QR code very soon here. Let me share my screen. Okay. And th thank you, Adam, for the for the, all the useful information. Who would have thought about uh, bugs and oats, right? Um, yep. <laughs> so now it's give, it you know it gives you something to think about. And uh, and I, I personally thought it was very useful. Um, and uh, you know after we're done with this poll and then also with the QR code, uh, you will all be transition transitioning to uh, informal discussion, and you will be. Um, uh, you'll be a panelist. That means you'll be able to uh, show your video if you want to, or at least you know unmute yourself and and have an informal discussion um, uh, after we're done with this. And I would like to bring up another important uh, thing to your notice, and it's it's a survey that you will be receiving after we're done with this week on Friday. Uh, please look out for an email from our ag communication team. Um, and that, that survey, uh, I think it's very important for us to not only um, plan for our programmings, extension programmings in the future, but also to get a good indication of some of the topics, some of the how to, how to manage our research efforts, efforts in the future. I know it's another email in your inbox, but that will be very helpful for us to, uh, for us to, um, to how to modify ourselves while moving forward. Um, so if you can, if you can do that, you know it will it will likely be in your inbox. I'm thinking about Saturday, so uh, if you can do that, you know when you when you have time, that'd be that'd be great. And and thank you very much for attending uh, today's um, today's webinar. Um, 
and taking time to listen to, um, to two presentations today.